Hi everybody, it's Meg from Books Off the Beaten Path, and today you will be watching the highly anticipated Nancy Drew episode. We're going to talk Nancy from top to bottom, start to finish. I have a bunch of notes, I have some books to show you, and interesting fun facts to wow your friends at cocktail parties when the inevitable Nancy Drew conversation comes up. So, let's get going. Um, first thing I want to say is that I have my Topo Chico. It's not Topo Chico. It's Topo Chico. It's certainly not cheap. And I've got that here. It's hot and okie dokie, but we're getting through. So I'm going to take a little sip and then we'll get started. First off, who is Nancy Drew? Just in case you've been living under a rock. Nancy Drew is a female detective, and she's part of a book series over which 800 million copies of her books have been sold. She's been translated into just about every language, and she's been around forever. Um, she was ghostwritten by a woman by the name of Carolyn Keene, who never existed. She never will exist. She was just a pseudonym for a whole bunch of ghostwriters. So... What's interesting, let's start from the beginning. So the Hardy Boys came first. The Hardy Boys came out in 1926 and they came first and they were super popular. And they were so popular that even the girls were reading them. So a man by the name of Edward, I have to get his name right, Edward Straitmeyer, I'll put his picture up right here. He looks a little stern, doesn't he? He was the one that decided, he created the Hardy Boys and he was the one that decided to create Nancy Drew. Now, he didn't write them. He didn't write either of these series, but he created them for his little publishing house called Stratemeyer Syndicate. The, they just called it the Syndicate, like it was a mob, but it was actually a children's book publishing house. So originally, they were gonna call her, if she wasn't Nancy Drew, they were gonna call her Stella Strong Diana Drew, Nan Nelson, Nan Drew, or Helen Hale. So they all got around and talked about it, and they were like, hmm, Nan Drew's pretty good, but let's make it longer so it will fit on the book better. It'll be Nancy Drew. So I want you to know, you know how I go around to all the old bookstores and everything like that, and I want you to know before we get into it, what if you want to collect Nancy Drew's, kind of what you're looking for. So the Nancy Drew book went through all kinds of different evolutions. And I'm going to look show you the covers first so you know what you're looking for. So this is actually the second edition. Not second edition, but second printing. And so the way you can tell these, these were done in the 30s, is that they've got the orange right here. And they have just the silhouette of Nancy down here at the bottom. This is actually the second run. Um, the first ones, the oranges were a little different and I don't believe she is in holding a magnifying glass, but these are the ones from the 30s. These are the ones that you really wanna pick up if you wanna be collecting. You really wanna get these. So that's orange holding a magnifying glass. Then, they came out again and they did the third printing. And the third printing, if you'll notice, is blue. And she's in blue, so it's blue on blue, okay? This was still in the 30s, but a little bit later. A um, little bit later in the 30s, a little more 35-ish, a little more 40s and everything. The first ones with the orange are early 30s. Then we've got the 40s into the 50s and this one if you'll notice is we still have kind of some blue on blue but if you'll notice this nancy is supposed to be oh i'm covering my mouth she's supposed to be more modern looking which i think she is she's a little more 40s and 50s looking with her magnifying glass and then in 1958 we got this which is what i think most people are familiar with it's the yellow the yellow spine and it's the illustrations on the front and um, so I can show you that I've got here is the original bungalow mystery from 1930 and then here is the 1958 
bungalow mystery. And if you notice also, the original was longer. They decided to completely redo them in 1958 and make them a lot shorter because they thought they were too long. And I was very disappointed about that because my history with Nancy Drew is the very first Nancy Drew I got was I th the Ghost of Blackwood Hall, which I'll put up here. And I'll return to that again in, in towards her evolution when we're talking about that. But I just couldn't understand why people were reading this. I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it at all. But when I started finding the older ones, the original prints, I was like, wow, this is a fantastic character and this is a fantastic story. So I'm not a fan of the reprints of the 1950s. Um, but we'll just, you know, maybe you are. That's okay. Well, that sounded mean, didn't it? Of course it's okay. All right, so now we've talked about how there wasn't really a ghostwriter. So the first person who was writing, her name was Mildred Wirt, Wirt Benson. And I have a picture of her here and she wrote Nancy Drew much like herself. And she was smart and athletic and outdoorsy. And so she wrote a Nancy Drew like that. And that's the Nancy Drew from the early 31s that I was really attracted to. I just love that early Nancy Drew character. So Mildred's right in the way and she's doing all of this. And so the world that she created, let me give you just a little bit about Nancy's world. So Nancy starts out in the books, the, before they changed it in 1958, she is 16 and she's graduated high school. In none of these books will you ever see her going to school. She just doesn't go to school. So she's 16 in the original books. Later, when they revised it, they made her 18 because I guess they thought 16 was a little young. She lives consistently in River Heights, which is a little town, I believe, in Illinois. Um, I didn't actually, I should have found that in my research, but I didn't actually. Um, her mother is gone. In the original books, her mother died at the age of 10. And in the later books, her mother died when she was three. I guess that was to save us, the reader, for feeling bad about a 10 year old going through the death of a parent, which we would feel bad about. We would feel bad about that. There is a housekeeper and her name is Hannah. And Hannah in the earlier books is clearly a servant. They send her to the kitchen. Hannah, make those sandwiches. Hannah, oatmeal. But in the later books, Hannah becomes more of a surrogate mother to Nancy, which I don't think Nancy really needs, but she sort of becomes that. And um, she is, her father is Carson Drew, which is one of the greatest names I think of any fictional character. I love the name Carson Drew. Hold on, I gotta take a sip. I'm getting parched. Carson Drew is her father and he's a lawyer. And he would often ask Nancy in the earlier books to help him with a case. So he couldn't have been that great of a lawyer. They said that he was great, but if you're relying on your 16 year old daughter to help you with the cases, I don't know, I'd be a little suspicious of that if I was his client. I'd be like, oh, you're, so your daughter is gonna interview that witness. Okay, Carson. Huh. All right, so she's got two best friends that are actually her cousins, Bess Marvin and George Fain. And I just wanna say something about Bess. Bess in the later books is portrayed as a heavyset girl and they do a lot of fat shaming. Like, oh Bess, you shouldn't be eating that and everything like that. And I'm really disappointed in that. I've reread a lot of the Nancy Drew books to get ready for this video, but I'm really disappointed in all the fat shaming they did with Bess, but that's in the later books. In the earlier books, she, they're not really in it that much. And then she has this boyfriend who's more of an, I don't want to say he's on and off, but he's not in it that much. And his name is Ned Nickerson. And Ned Nickerson goes to Emerson College, which is a real place. And, but he doesn't live in town, which is very convenient for Nancy because Nancy doesn't have Ned all the time. So she is just amazing. Nancy is very adept. She's very intelligent. She's a skilled driver. This is, this is in the earlier books. So this is at 16. 
At 16, she's a skilled driver. She can repair her own car, which was huge. She had her car, it was a blue roadster, which I don't know exactly what that means, but I envision it like a blue convertible. She drove motorboats, she spoke French, she was a, a, an excellent swimmer, she was a, a sharpshooter with her gun, but she never really has a gun. She was a gourmet cook, and you know what? She was an excellent bridge player, which was a value back then, because I don't know if you guys have ever played bridge. I've tried to, but I'm too stupid. I can't get it figured out. Maybe, maybe you guys could write me and tell me how to play it. I don't know. Or maybe you don't want to spend your time doing that, writing some weird woman on a YouTube telling her how to play bridge. I wouldn't want to do that either. Moving on. So anyway, so Nancy went through several evolutions. Hardy Boys came first. Um, she, her hair has changed a little bit. It went from strawberry blonde to very big blonde, or for strawberry blonde to big red. She was just Titian haired is what they called her. Um, she was never affected by the Great Depression or by World War II. It just was not mentioned in any of the books. It just didn't happen in River Heights. River Heights never got the memo that those things were happening. So she was never really affected by that. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, they were worried when the first books came out, when the early ones came out in the 30s, that she was too outspoken and too flippant. And they thought that people wouldn't like that, but it was just the opposite. People loved it. People thought it was fantastic. Isn't it interesting how when you go back and you look and then you look at our society today and how it looks like we've gone 50 years backwards in time somehow? Because in the ones in the 30s, she was just rocking it. Um, I'll take a moment here to talk about some of the illustrations in the books. And I have one note. I have one here. And I just want to... Um, show this to you. So in the original illustrations in the early books, they were done by a man, a man by the name of Richard Tandy, who was a fashion illustrator. And you can really tell, let me hold this up, see if you can see this. This is the bungalow mystery. And they're on a lake in a storm. And so Nancy has gotten out to pull the boat in order to get them closer to shore. Oh, Twitch is here with me, she's interested too. And then I just wanted to show you this one, which I thought was so amazing. Again, this is a Tandy. And this one is Nancy in her flapperware crawling up the side of a house because she has to get into this, you know, and it's to this house. And look how cute she looks. And she's got her head up and everything. And one of the things that the nuances that the books went through with all the illustrations and everything like that is that if you look at the bungalow mystery now, the cat is going to knock over my, hold on, Twitch, for God's sakes, sorry, sorry about that. If you look in the bungalow mystery now, she's hiding. And she's looking and she's kind of looking stressed and everything like that. But she's sure not hiding in the earlier ones. So she kind of becomes, as the books move through, she becomes more victim-like. But I found out some fascinating, fascinating, as I fight with the cat, I found out some fascinating facts about the older or the newer Nancy Drews. So, oh, also, I wanted to give you this. There was an essay that I read about Nancy Drew and the people were, the person who wrote it was very critical of Nancy Drew. And she was saying that the only reason that Nancy Drew was successful was because she played into an anti-feminist thought that all women want to be rich and white. And which is what Nancy was. Nancy was rich and Nancy was very white. And so this person who wrote this essay was talking about how there are no people of color in it and Nancy never has to struggle for anything. She never even gets a job. She spends, I mean, I mean, she's perpetually 16 and 18. So, I mean, I don't really expect her to get a job, but this woman was very, very anti-Nancy, did not like her at all. And said that if you look at her as a feminist model for young women, then you're looking at it incorrectly. So, 
food for thought, different opinions. We like to bring different opinions to the channel. Okay, so I have to go through. All right, so in 1959, they decided to redo all of them. They took out all the illustrations from the insides of the books. They gave it the yellow cover and the illustration just on the front and they made them shorter. They made them a lot shorter. And then for the first time in 19, in the 1960s, Nancy is a little bit, she has that toxic, toxic positivity. She's a little bit too positive for people. Her father becomes much more protective and she starts going to church. She doesn't go to church necessarily in the novels, but she starts talking about how she's going to church and everything like that. Now, remember, these were ghost written by a whole bunch of different people. After Mildred Whit Benson stopped writing them, they were just ghost written by all sorts of people. And we will never know these people's names because the syndicate um, made them sign over all their rights. They never got any royalties. They never got any credit, nothing like that. And so what the syndicate would do was they would say, we want Nancy to go to a place in the South and solve a mystery involving a ring. And then the person would write the story and hand it over to them. And they would edit it and then everything like that. So they were giving the plots to the ghost writers. They were giving the overview. And then the ghost writers would come in and just kind of do whatever they wanted with it. And frankly, you can tell as you read the books all the way through, especially after 1958, how they change, how one sort of feels more similar to another one. And then all of a sudden the style shifts and everything. And you can see that. You can tell that especially if you're a, a, a super reader like I am, like you like to read all through the series and stuff. I'm gonna move over this way a little because I'm getting a glare from outside from the blazing sun. Okay, so now for the shocking parts. You ready for the shocking parts? Okay, so in 1986 and 1997, they started this series. It, it was sold from the syndicate to Simon & Schuster. And Simon & Schuster wanted more mature mysteries and incorporated romance into them. Okay, and so also the um, Ned Nickerson and Nancy get a lot more serious. So the first one I wanted to show you is I wanted to show you this illustration of a cover. This is the hit and run mystery from 1986. And doesn't it look a little porny? To me, it looks a little porny. The hit and run mystery, and she's in that bathing suit, and then we have that angry man. I guess that's supposed to be Ned. I don't know, I didn't read that one, but it looks a little porn hub to me. And you know, the title kind of leans into it. Um, also, there is this one here, and I think it's, oh, I forgot what it was called. I wanna say it's something about murder on ice, murder on the ice. And in that one, and I have a copy of the um, cover right up here, in that one, it is implied that she and Ned Nickerson have a sexual relationship. Uh, what? That can't happen. I never want that to happen to Nancy because that just complicates things. It just complicates a lot of things. So moving on. Oh yeah, it's called I don't know what it's called. I'll find it. I'll link it down there below. But in the 80s, starting in the 80s, she becomes much more victim-like. She is knocked out all the time. She's chloroformed. She's, you know, manhandled. She doesn't fight back as much. The, the covers show that. They show that she is um, a little bit more afraid of things. She's hiding more. It's also starting in 1986, she stopped solving the mysteries the way she had been solving them previously. So starting in 1986, when they rewrote everything, she would overhear stuff. And then that would be a clue. Like she would be hiding and she would hear the two bank robbers say, oh, we're going to knock over the bank at three o'clock. So she didn't really discover that. 
she didn't really find that like in the early ones in the hidden staircase and um, the bungalow mystery. And one of my all time favorites is the password to Larkspur Lane. And that one is a fantastic one. But she finds the clues in that. She connects the puzzles. She's thinking. And later on in the 80s and the 90s, she's not actually thinking. It's just all sort of being handed to her. And I think that's a disappointment. I mean, I, I think that young women or young men or whoever should still read these books because I think that they're valuable and I think that they're fun. But I'm disappointed that they sort of had felt like they had to dumb it down. That's just me. Now, I don't do movies on the show and I, and I don't do TV, but I just have to mention a couple, just a couple because it is Nancy Drew. Now, first off, I'm going to mention that there were some movies made in 1938 and I don't know where you can find them, but apparently I was reading that they're really super bad and that Nancy is portrayed as just kind of a ditz and she's a schemer and she's not really that smart. And Ned Nickerson is not her boyfriend, but he's the clumsy next door neighbor. And so those were all done in 1938 and apparently they really bombed because they weren't at all what the people who were reading the books were expecting. But then we have some, we have some more modern versions of Nancy Drew. And I really, really enjoyed, I believe it was 2006 or 2007, the, Eva, the Emma Roberts. If you haven't seen that version of Nancy Drew, I really enjoyed that. Now I read some criticism of it um, and they said she comes off as a dork, but I never thought she did. I thought in the movie she was fantastic because she knew who she was, she knew what she wanted and she was very committed to wearing those penny loafers and dressing the way she did and keeping herself healthy and athletic. And so if you haven't seen that one, see that one. That's a good one. You ought to see that. But my all time favorites were in the 1970s when it was the Hardy Boys and the Nancy Drew Mysteries. And those are the ones with Pamela Sue Martin as Nancy. And then we had Parker Stevenson. Oh, was so in love with Parker Stevenson and Sean Cassidy, the do run, 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 the do run, run. And they were in, and they were often together. They would rarely have kind of separate ones. They sort of all work together and everything. But if you can find those, I'm sure you can find them on YouTube and stuff like that. Give them a watch. They're Pamela Sue, I think is my favorite. She's my favorite media. Nancy Drew, because she's pretty smart in it. And she was very pretty, pretty, very pretty. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the cultural impact of Nancy Drew. Now, Nancy Drew spawned a lot of other female-centered mysteries, like Judy Bolton, which I've spoken about in other episodes. Um, Cherry Ames, who I love, she spawned that. Um, and so she's she's really been very influential to a lot of other girl-centered mysteries that came out. And then people that cite particular fondness for her are people like Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Oprah Winfrey, Barbara Walters, Barbara Streisand. Um, on the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton. On the Republican side, Laura Bush. They just all really love Nancy Drew. And it's hard not to love Nancy. I got to tell you, it's hard not to love her. So I do want to tell you about, I looked online and I found, which I will put in the link, I found the Nancy Drew Fan Club, which just sounds fantastic to be a part of the Nancy Drew Fan Club. And I've got some notes on it and I will post the link down in um, the description for the Nancy Drew fan club. And it's all these Nancy Drew fans. And the biggest thing that they do, I mean, they do charity work. They'll have, you know, like conventions and they'll donate to local libraries, which is just amazing. Sorry, Twitch is chewing up all of my notes. I guess she disagrees with it. But they have these conventions every year. And the one that I want to go to more than anything else is the one in 2023. I don't know if you can see this here because of the glare. They're going to be in Salem, Massachusetts. And they're going to go to Salem. And let me read this to you here. They're planning a haunted Salem convention loosely based on the ghost hunting classic mysteries of the Nancy Drew books. 
And so they are going to go to Salem, Massachusetts, and it's going to be so much fun. And I would love to do that. I would do that in a, in a hot minute if I had the money, but I don't. So I don't get to go. Uh, but all of you Nancy Drew fans who are going, have a wonderful time. I hope that you have a great time with your collections and different things that you're going to bring to the convention. And I'm so glad that you're out there. I'm so glad that I found the Nancy Drew Fan Club. And I'm going to post a couple of little Nancy Drew merch things that I don't know if you can get these through the fan club. But, you know, Nancy Drew for people everywhere. I don't want to say people of my generation because she's in video games and you can do this weird voyeurism thing where you can go on YouTube and you can watch people play video games. Now maybe everybody knew about this but I didn't know about this and that's kind of a weird voyeurism thing but whatever. But and she's got video games, she's got graphic novels, she's just wonderful. She's all over the place and I still think she's a role model because I still think that she's pretty She's pretty darn independent. Nobody ever, one thing I've noticed through all of the books, the earlier ones and then spanning the later ones. Now I've not read the ones after 1986, but I've read the ones through the 70s and nobody ever talks to her about coming in at a certain time, which I just, just struck me as this girl was so mature and trusted, she never had a curfew. They never said get back at a certain time. Carson doesn't say it. Hannah doesn't say it. Ned Nickerson doesn't say it. So I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool. I don't know why. I just picked up on that. Maybe I have her few issues. All right. So my final thing is Halloween is coming up. I love it. And I love my Nancy Drew mysteries that have to do with the ghosts. Remember the ghost of Blackwood Hall was the very first one that I ever got. And so I am doing a cross stitch. Let me get my, ow. I'm doing a cross stitch that I got from Waxing Moon Designs. I don't know if you guys have seen them, but I am doing Midnight Manor. Can you see that? Isn't that cute? The little Victorian house, the little ghost. And here's where I'm at on it. I have to get it facing the right way. So I'm just starting on the house. Here's the front door. Here are the windows with the French doors and everything like that. And that's coming along swimmingly. So I have to share my little flossy. Oh, and look how the sun is reflecting right on my little house. Anyway, that's super fun. Waxing Moon Designs. I believe you can find them on Etsy. So shout out to them. Shout out to the Nancy Drew Fan Club. And shout out to all of you. I've had a great week. I've had lots of new subscribers. So thank you for subscribing. I have some names, but I forgot to list them. But I wanted to say thank you. We're having a lot of fun on this channel. And next up, we're going to talk about classics that you want to read. Classics you don't ever want to read and some classics that you can get away with the just the cliff notes version but we're going to give spoilers on those so that'll be in a couple of weeks with michelle thank you so much for watching sorry about the cat interruption talk to you later bye